technology is a big enabler. I did download a lot of music between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. this morning because I just had to stay awake to write uh, that speech for the corporate crowd. Uh, and, but I wasn't nervous about that. I was nervous, and I am, about this because it's not the resumes that are in the room. Uh, it, it's that, it's that um, picture of uh, purposeful power that's in the room. Uh, and so while the film is inspiring, it's also, uh, it causes one to perspire uh, because, uh, well, it's, the, it's, the, it's proof positive uh, that you can't take the view that it can't be done. It's proof positive when somebody says, I know, uh, but it's, it's a time of despair, uh, and it is, and it's a time of pain, and it is, and there's nothing that can be done about it, and you can begin to believe that, especially if you're a middle-aged boot salesman. But, uh, <laughs> but when you, when, yeah, that's me, but when you look at, <laughs> when you look at uh, that, and when you look at this, you think to yourself, uh, I don't know, let's see if you can make any sense. That's what I think anyways. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it was one of those nights where uh, I ended up, uh, all over the map, so I'm going to read you a poem to start, okay? Um, uh, this is a cool one, and, and the good news is somebody famous wrote it, and it, it is... <laughs> yeah, it was, that, it was that bad a night. This is not a Jeff poem. <laughs> Roses are red, violets are blue, hope the speech is over, and so do you. No, uh, th th this, one, this one's actually consequential. It says, it's an excerpt. Turning and turning in the widening jar, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Listen to this, last two lines. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. William Butler Yeats, 1919, the poem's called The Second Coming. And he writes this in the aftermath of the First World War. And he looks at the destruction of a generation and of a world order, and he says, the best lack all conviction, meaning they don't know where to turn, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. Those are the people, the ones who are full of passion and intensity, who are spending $2 billion on this congressional election cycle. The vitriol of the left and the vitriol of the right that says they're wrong, I'm right. The ones that say there is no middle ground, there is no place discursively for us to build civic society. I'm right, they're wrong. Let me demonize other. And they are equally venal, both points of view. From too many perspectives, we're witness in this moment to what I fear could be the civic center's disintegration. And I'm not talking specifically about the blood sport of politics, where they're spending $2 billion to say, uh, I got a seat so I can say he's really wrong. I'm, I'm talking about nonpartisan failures, like the nonpartisan failure to feed our children, or the nonpartisan failure to educate our children or the nonpartisan, willy-nilly destruction of the natural environment that's our home. Like you, I see the widening holes in the heart of our social and our civic framework, and I have to tell you, it's not just lack of sleep. I feel despair and, at times, real futility. But precisely because I am a third-generation entrepreneur who believes in the generative power of the private sector, and precisely because I knew my immigrant grandfather who left the land of his birth to come to America, which was an ideal he understood then without the internet, that America represented maybe humanity's last great civic possibility of engaged democracy, specifically because of these reasons, I am determined to imagine how a new model of social change can be developed and deployed and scaled, how a new model of social change can invite and compel the CEO, the private sector leader, to the table of civic engagement. You're invited, you are drafted, you are um, welcome and you're compelled. Because if we can bring the CEO with a, the generative uh, uh, creativity of the private sector to sit at the table, not to listen, but to participate, subordinating egos and agendas to engage genuinely, can build and we must build a different model of social change. And when I say we have to build a different model of social change, you can see uh, a, a social change model in a neighborhood. The problem is, the problem is, you can also see the Harlem Children's Zone, right? And when I started working with Jeff Cannon in the Harlem Children's Zone, it was a very small neighborhood. Now it's a bigger, small neighborhood. Right? But my kids, our oldest son goes to Columbia. And while he taught in the Promise Charter Academy, uh, he, he went uptown from where he lives in, in, at, at Columbia to the school. So it's a very short distance and a very long voyage. Right? And so what's the point? Well, the problem is we don't live, we do live in neighborhoods, but we live in a, in a universe of connected neighborhoods. And so if that neighborhood's okay, 
because people stand there and say, I will partner with you and create a model of social change, a systemic view of social change in that neighborhood, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Because if this neighborhood is not so blessed, you have haves and have nots again. You have disparities that are tensions and tensions that resolve because we're humans in bad ways, right? And so it's what we, we have to build legitimate change models neighborhood by neighborhood and, and we have to build change models that understand that nation state boundaries are arbitrary boundaries. Climate change is not bound by nation state boundaries, right? And so it's a complete and utter moral failure that our country can't enact climate legislation. It is. But it's only, that's only half of the problem. Because I went to Copenhagen as the CEO. I, I did put a suit on for that, that, that show. But I, I, uh, so, you, know, you, gotta, you can fool them, because uh, I don't know what you guys do on these things, but everybody looks at your tie and stuff like that. I was wearing my yellow boots there, because, and, and it was cool. And the only guy that knows was Prince Charles. I, and I thought that was awesome. He looks down, and he cracked up. And I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, yep, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, what do you say? Oh, I didn't, I, yes, sir, your eminence, whatever it was. It was cool. Uh, that was the highlight of my visit. That's how, that's how bad that visit was. And I thought, hey, I got the cure for global warming. Get these guys to shut the hell up, right? For a starter, the greenhouse bloviation coming out of the mouths of the, of the so called elected leaders of our world. I thought to myself, hey, I'm taking the tie off and go make another pair of boots because this is uselessness. And that's not cynicism. I've been at this too long to be a cynic. I'm too stupid to be a cynic. I am a, I'm, a, I'm a confirmed skeptic. And my heart gets broken time after time. But I keep thinking to myself, you can't, you can't not try. You can't not try. And so, we, so the first thing they said when Copenhagen failed was, see it in Mexico. And I thought, I'm going to sit that one out. Right? I'm going to sit that one out because the model is incomplete. The model doesn't have a governance. There's no global governance of problem solving. So we can do it neighborhood by neighborhood. Can we scale it? I'll tell you, who's we? What I get paid to do is scale, right? If I can't scale an idea, Tim will find somebody who can. If I told people I nailed this one neighborhood, boy, we have market share there. They'd say, you're telling me this why? I'd say, well, because I did a great job in that neighborhood. I said, yeah, but your competitors are, have a national scale or a global scale. Have you figured out how to take an idea and sell it beyond that neighborhood? And I think to myself, well, at Timberland, I think to myself, I better figure that out. And by the way, just like you find in social change, each neighborhood is different. We had a woman on our board at Timberland back in the day whose name is, is Indra Nui. She's the, the, chair, the, the chair who leads Pepsi. Indra is uh, a force of nature. Um, the, the, you know the, the, the story, The Portrait of the Iris is a Young Man by James Joyce? I would love to give you stories of the portrait of the developing third generation CEO in the hands of a lethal killer board member named Ingenuity. That's the, that's the portrait of a board drubbing as a relatively young man. It's unbelievable. I learned more from the pain she inflicted on me than, than uh, you know, the Chanel suit. And she says, that's a lovely excuse. Oh, jeez. OK. Uh, all right. And you know what she said? She, she had gone to visit a Timberland retail store somewhere. And she said, my, that display was uninspiring. <laughs> I said, thank you, yeah. Uh, and I said to her, oh, but Indra, Indra, it's a very complicated business model. This is, I didn't, I, <laughs> this is the naive things you, you say as, a, as, as you fail your way forward in your career. She said, really, tell me. And I said, well, uh, do you know how many points of sale we have across the country? And so to make sure that everyone is just so, it's, it's, tri it's tricky business. And she said, do you know how many we have at PepsiCo? And I said, I think I'm in the wrong channel of conversation. <laughs> Only like 17 times the number that you have, and you refresh them once a season, once every six months, fall versus spring. We refresh them once a week. And I thought, what's your point? Yeah, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Right? <laughs> All right, shoot me. Get it over, right? And, and she said, she, and she said, figure it out, slugger. Right? And by the way, that's exactly what the CEO's paradigm is. <clears throat> when you pressure the CEO, she has one of two choices, innovate and respond, or be replaced. Now, you can spend $2 billion in an election cycle to get half of America, to you get 100% of America to talk about it, and roughly half of America to go to the polls. That is a relatively inefficient model. It's OK, it only happens every couple of years. And so, it's, it, so how do you think about politicians being accountable anyways? When they, I don't get it, right? Because every single night, we poll our retail stores around the world. I know about our sales yesterday in Japan. 
The, it's not polling data like, do they like my speech? It's polling data like, did they buy your ideas or did they reject the ideas as not strong enough? And they bought something from North Face instead. That's a different sort of accountability. That, and that's the rhythm that a CEO operates inside. Why don't we want that at the table in terms of social change? Why don't we want the CEO mentality that says, I know how to scale. Why don't I want the CEO mentality at the table that says, I also understand a rhythm of accountability that's visceral and measurable and accountable in a different sense. It's not to disparage existing models. It's to say, look, inspect with our eyes and our hearts. They're incomplete. Federal government spends $40 billion a year to feed the hungry in America. And there's 17 million hungry children in America. Now, you could say, I, it's 40 billion, it should be 50 billion. No! Do you know how many millions of dollars states return to the federal government every single year of that appropriation? Think about this, I'm not making this up. The government appropriates, they did their job, they set social policy, and they send the money to the great state of Colorado, Governor Ritter is finishing his term, the great state of Colorado. They send the money and they say, we'll feed kids school lunches because they fall below the poverty line. And so we do. What happens in the summertime? Some well-intended policymaker forgot that school's out. Alice Cooper, school's out for the summer. These kids aren't getting school lunches. The money is there, the hunger is there. Now, I tell you, the CEO of me wants to absolutely just blow up. That's a business problem that we could solve in 13 seconds if we're at the table. Now, so you say, well, then stop making a speech and go to the table, right, Jeff? Right? But moral capitalism, which is what I'm here to advocate for, moral capitalism is based on and predicated on more than good intentions. Because a CEO of good intentions is like, I don't know, it's a, it's a news story maybe, but it's not a sustainable news story. Because good intentions, right? Good intentions are necessary, but they are not sufficient. I've been through the road of CEO as philanthropist or CEO as well-intended fellow, right? My heart bleeds. Don't cry for me, Argentina, right? So I'll tell you a, a good example of such thinking. In the, I don't know, I don't remember when, sometime in the last decade, uh, I had in the constellation of Timberland relationships, a relationship with this Hollywood actor uh, who was very, very passionate about the rape and genocide in Darfur. He thought that, you know, that one must do something in that. By the coincidence of circumstance, he and I ended up conspiring together on the phone wait, late one night. He designed a boot, not on my watch. It was magnificent, really artfully done. We made 100 pairs of them for celebrities. And we had a contest, me and him, to see who could give them away to more celebrities. It shows you how clever I am. He has a celebrity Rolodex, and I've seen movies. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to predict who came in second in that case. OK, all right, I did. I came in second. But I, 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 it was a good effort, right? I gave away one pair to Bruce Springsteen. We, 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 we did. I got my oldest son to take me to a concert, and we got him backstage, and we gave Springsteen a pair of boots. And that was it, one. He gave away 99 pairs, and nobody cared anyways. So I was in the White Plains store the other day during this episode, and the store is relatively quiet. And uh, into the store walks a very attractive young lady, and she's one years old as me. Uh, when I see an attractive young woman, she's probably 45. <laughs> so <laughs> don't laugh. You'll get old someday, too. So she walks in, and there's not a lot going on in the store. And I think to myself, aha, this is a target-rich environment. I ought to be able to have the Darfur conversation. So I follow her around, now politely, because you don't want to stalk people in a retail store. But I, I'm not kind of doing my thing, and when I catch her, Give, give the man nod, I catch your eye, and I, I bring it right over to the Darfur. Uh, and, and, I, and I explain rape and genocide, and, and she's like, no sale. And I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. And she says, no sale. And I, I said, she said, well, do you have a factory in Darfur? I said, no. She said, well, do you have a business in Darfur? No. Do you have a family from Darfur? I said, no, what are, you, what are you asking this for? And she said, I don't understand the connection of Darfur to Boots. I don't get it. And so she didn't say, but she did mean I mistrust it. I don't understand what you're talking to me about. It's not that I don't care about the issue. I do. It's not that, but I didn't come into your store to talk to you about rape and genocide. I want a size nine. So what, you know, what are you talking to me about? And why are you talking to me? So I was really bummed out. I mean, it really didn't work. We made all this effort and had no impact. That's the CEO with good intentions. I suppose the CEO with good intentions and better execution of mission, mission thoughtful strategy. If you want moral capitalism to take its seat at the table, the skill of scale, the skill of uh, brand building, the skill of um, repetitively executing with excellence, a built to last kind of business model, CEO's got to come to the table with more than good intentions. So I want to see uh, a, a politician with real insight 
uh, on this issue of how to develop a message and a point of view, I went and saw the former president of the United States, President Clinton, in Harlem. And uh, I got a, 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 lecture, a lecture that's so spectacular, I, I just want to repeat it to you because it, I believe in, there are two elements of moral capitalism. Actually, I'm going to go, yeah, I'll, I'll, let's do them this way. Uh, the two elements of moral capitalism are talking. One is business people are self-interested. That's not a shocking statement. Everyone in this room is self-interested. What do you think the CEO is interested in? Higher profits. Yep, check. That's what we get paid for. Higher profits respond to two things, consumer demand and lower costs. Moral capitalism sees the, the synthesis of the two as an opportunity to drive, drive profits and purpose. Let me just spend five minutes and I'll tell you what I mean. How do you drive lower costs in the notion of social justice? Well, you don't have to worry about it. You, you can drive lower costs by just exploiting, right? Our industry's got a good reputation, the, the, the apparel industry, the footwear industry, slave labor, kids tied to desks making soccer balls. You've read all those stories, right? That's one way to lower costs. It's not a sustainable way to lower costs, even if you don't care about the social issue. It's not sustainable, because the activists will find you. <laughs> it's terrible, you know? And <laughs> Picture the kid and you think, oh, that's embarrassing. All right, so you don't do it anymore. Because at the country club, they say, oh, they caught you. It's very embarrassing, right? So you don't do that. <laughs> There's a certain section of the country club that's left aside for the guys who got caught. It's just terrible, right? <laughs> and everybody says, I don't want to sit there. Oh, that's the table of the guys that got caught, right? And there's, there's, <laughs> um, there's also, in general, not too many CEOs that I know, including the ones that have gotten caught, that intended it. Right, that, that, that got out of their way in the morning to say, let's see how we can exploit young, uh, young people in order to make our gross margin. They didn't do their diligence, they didn't follow through their, their supply chain to understand, but I find it to be more stupid than willful. Uh, that doesn't excuse it, I'm just telling you, more stupid than willful. And so, what do you think about Walmart aligning its business strategy of everyday lower cost with the notion of um, environmental uh, uh, stewardship? You think it's a... I mean, that's, that's probably baloney, right? The Walmart guys, yeah, I know they changed all the light bulbs in their stores, and that did save you know, so many thousands of tons of emissions, but, uh, but they only did that in order to lower costs. Well, that's, that's true, they did lower costs. And what about the fact that they redirected the way they managed their fleet? Because they have more trucks on the road. They're the largest private fleet in the world, right? Pepsi's second. But uh, even bigger than UPS, right, is, is the Walmart fleet. So they didn't really, they don't really care about the environment. They just did that to save the millions and millions, in fact, $200 million worth of uh, costs that Walmart boiled out of the system by being environmental thinkers. But they're not good guys, right? They're good business leaders, right? And so that's the question. That's the question. Can you be a, is the question, is the CEO a good person, good intentions, or a good business leader? And I ask you, why does it have to be or? Why couldn't it be and? Why couldn't it be and? Why couldn't we say systematically, if you look through the supply chain, look, Indra Nui, I mentioned her, she decided to reduce the amount of plastic that's used in packaging for her soft drinks. Good business or good for the environment? Yes. She decided to take on the issue of water. And so did Mukhtar Kent at, 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 at Coke. These two guys don't hang in general, Mukhtar and, and Indra. But I've been in the room where they aren't hanging, but they are collaborating. It's not pretty. Right? Because you've got two wicked powerful guys that all they want to do in a corporate sense is kill the other person. But when it comes to the issue of water management on a global basis, even Coke and Pepsi have to figure a way to collaborate. Because if you want to make social change at a sustainable level, you've got to do it. And so is that what they're trying to do, social change? Or are they just trying to ensure a source of supply? Because if there's no clean water, you can't make your Coke and Pepsi. So then what, right? So right, are they being a principled or are they being simply hard-headed business people? Yes. The answer is yes, they're being both. That's the supply chain view of moral capitalism. It says you can lower costs, which means improve profits, and lower your environmental profile. And the, the evidence that's building about thoughtful CEOs who are looking at, at the supply chain as a real way to make a difference, lower your environmental profile and lower your costs, improve your profits, that's a good one. That's the Dire Straits song, money for nothing and your chicks for free, right? That's a good one. I did not download that song, although I should have. It would have been, it would have been good. The problem is there's, because you are really smart people, so uh, you know that there's, uh, there's an asymptote for that kind of a conversation. The obvious conversation about change the light bulbs, right? So I, I'm just checking, because I, I, I'm curious. Ah, okay, so we did this. What, I, so this makes the Charles Hotel more sophisticated than the White House, right? Because when I got invited to a, 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 one of those private conversations, uh, they were so excited. 
you know, welcome to the old office building. And whether it's called the executive office, but I think it's yeah, great. And they're so excited because they own the building, right? The new administration. I think this is actually, this is my building. I'm the taxpayer and you're working for me. But that's not the point of view. And it's not, it has nothing to do with this administration. It's just the way all politicians think, right? They lose track instantly of, of what their job is, right? They're, they're, we're working for them. No, last time I checked, you're working for me. And so sitting in this moot, and sitting, this, and, and sitting on a table this size with nuclear power uh, uh, utilities, and they're trading on the, on the climate legislation. I think, objectively, this is wicked cool. That's Boston talk, but it's really cool. I would love to show my boys what backroom politics looks like, because it's like every civics class you ever hated, but it's right in front of you, and they're making these horse trades. But I thought to myself, leave aside how cool it is. This is disgusting. This is unbelievable. They're trading nuclear power for a different thing here. And, I think, and in the meantime, all I can do is stare at the lights. And the reason is I'm sweating in the suit. And the reason I'm sweating in the suit is because they're, like they're halogen incandescent, burning up the environment. So I go to the men's room, and I whip out my tweeter, Twitter, whatever you think all that thing is, and, I am, I, I, and I'm, I'm standing in the men's room. OK, I, I, I'm going to get it for that, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to? We don't need more nuclear power. Change the friggin' light bulbs, is what my Twitter thing said. And, and then Robin's like, thanks for sending that from the White House. That was great. <laughs> but, but I think to myself, come on, come on. Now, in my, you go to Starbucks to the seventh floor of the headquarters in Seattle. Go visit the men's room if you're a guy, or go visit the ladies' room if you're a woman. <laughs> now, and I cannot predict what happens in the ladies' room, but I can tell you what happens in the men's room. Would you expect to walk, this is lunchtime, so we're going to keep this upscale, right? But when you walk into the bathroom at Starbucks, who have said that water is a precious resource, what would you expect to find in terms of bathroom paraphernalia? Well, what you'll find for bathroom paraphernalia is consistent with corporate message. They, it's not messaging. It's executability. CEOs know if you make a speech about water, and then you flush the urinal and you blow away half a Puget Sound, Someone's going to say, uh-oh, guys, saying one thing and doing another. I tell you, I went to the old executive office building to see what that was all about. And I tell you, the Potomac was down six inches after everybody flushed. It's not low flush toilets. And you think, oh, come on, what's the big deal about low flush toilets? Stop busting on the administration. I'm not. I'm making the point that the governance of social change would benefit from the presence of CEOs actively engaged in the conversation. We understand the accountability to execute through the supply chain. And so Starbucks has low flush toilets. In fact, no flush toilets. And they have the uh, leading edge technology to demonstrate this is what we believe in, and they can execute it right through the supply chain. Now, I am not saying that they're perfect, and I'm sure as hell not saying we are. But I am saying to my activist friends, please stop looking for perfect, because moral capitalism is an optimization of profit and purpose. And if you won't acknowledge that an optimization of profit and purpose is necessary, then honestly, we're going to have a hard time finding a way to build sustainable social change. That's what many activists say you're not welcome at the table, because you do despoil the environment. OK, here I am. My name is Jeffrey, and I'm a despoiler of the environment. Right? Step one in the process is engaged. Now, you want to talk about step two? Because if you will invite the pressure of the consumer, if you will invite the opportunity for social change, around the table, a conversation to have. There are things that we can do as CEOs in our supply chain to lower costs, which means improve profits, and lower environmental impact. But that's not all we can do. Because the truth is, there's an asymptote. When we decided to switch all the lights in our buildings, that was easy to do. It was a payback. The CFO doesn't even have to have to heart. She said to me, this is so straightforward. Even I support it. I said, thanks, Carrie. And then <laughs> she's, Carrie, I'm making fun of Carrie. If she was here, she would smack me. The truth is, she, she gets it, and the, and the reality is, I don't want anybody in, the, anybody in our, our company who doesn't get it. And get it, what's it? It is the, is the synthesis of commerce and justice. Not commerce or justice, not commerce and then justice, commerce and justice. The embracing of the dialectic that says, it ain't easy, it's never going to be easy. It's going to actually be jaw-grinding hard forever. But there is something generative about, a, about embracing the dialectic of commerce and justice. Deliver them in the same time. It can be done. It can be done. But when I came to her and I said, I want to build the sixth largest solar array in California, she said, how much is that going to cost? And I said, three million bucks. She said, what? I said, three million bucks. She said, uh, have you done the numbers? I said, I was a comparative literature major at Brown. <laughs> I can tell you in French how much it's going to cost. <laughs> she says, OK, you got to say payback in French? I said, OK. So she runs the numbers. She said, hey, generally projects have payback in years, not decades. <laughs> so this one's not so attractive. And, and I said, OK, we're at the asymptote of supply chain thinking. 
There's, you can boil as much as you can boil out, and then there's no more to boil out. And so are we done as CEOs? The answer is no. When Starbucks decided to switch coffee from one standard to a fair trade standard, how do you think that made coffee growers around the world feel? It made them feel good. Because the fair trade standard is different than the unfair trade standard. I'm not saying fair trade's perfect. I can get 100 activists here to tell you that the definition of a living wage is what I tell you, not what she tells you. Right? And so we can agree that we don't know exactly what a living wage means. But I can tell you this also, because I'm a third generation shoe entrepreneur, uh, fair trade standard's better than an unfair trade standard. And I'll take that. That's perfect is the enemy of the good. Let me just make today be better than tomorrow. Let me, uh, than yesterday, make tomorrow better than today, and I'm doing what moral capitalists are supposed to do, incrementing towards transformation, right? And so when, when Howard said, I'm switching to fair trade, it's like when Yvonne Chouinard said, I'm switching to organic cotton. It takes somebody first to go into the water. I'll tell you what, I didn't want to be the guys at Dunkin' Donuts the day that, that they decided uh, Starbucks' value proposition now includes fair trade, too. You can imagine the Dunkin' Donuts brand managers, and I know some of them, they're smart people, like, you know, we got one more thing we got to do. We got we even if we don't care. By the way, they do. Even if we don't care at Folgers, we got to care because the market's going to punish us if we don't play. What do you mean the market's going to punish? I mean that when you go to the point of sale, and Starbucks decides to say to their consumer, "Hey, don't buy coffee that's not fair trade grown." What do you think the consumer says? Okay, boss. Right? Must be because why in the hell are you paying six bucks for a latte yeah, otherwise? If you don't, if you don't believe. Right? But that's the power of brand builders to engage with consumers. We don't sell utility at Timberland. There's no chance in the world you're going to pay $125 for a pair of shoes on the basis of utility. The fact that people reach in their pocket and take out a buck and a quarter all around the world to buy Timberland shoes is a mixture of desire and need. And it's longer on desire than need because rarely the naked people come into our stores. <laughs> right? They come into their stores because there's something of value there. Right? What's, what's not valuable? about the beloved community? What's not valuable about social transformation? What's not valuable about the possibility of moral capitalism? Howard Schultz saying, I bet I can get paid for that. And you think, I see a venal CEO. Here he goes again. No, this is back to the Bill Clinton story. <coughs> he said to me, I love the Darfur thing. I really do. I have a pair. <laughs> That's great. There's 100 pairs. I know Clinton, and Don gave him a pair. Great. So I didn't even get that because I didn't have to think celebrity. OK, fine. So Mr. Mr. President's got a pair of Darfurs. It's great. I, I didn't even get a check in my box in that one. He goes, but no clue. That's what he mean. He said, when is the last time somebody came in a shoe store and said, I'm, I'm here to end rape and genocide? By the way, if they come into the store and say it, you want to probably call security, because this, really, this is a shoe store, right? <laughs> good point, good point. He said, have you spent any time looking at your product? Uh, you got to be careful, because he, he asks leading questions. And if you lean forward, you get knocked out. I said, uh, yes, sir. And he said, what's the logo? I thought, that's not a trick question. I know the answer to that. It's a tree. And he said, and environmental stewardship is part of the four pillars of belief that you live at Timberland every day, right? I said, yep. So how many trees have you planted so far in the world? Two or three million. He said, where? It's the Horchin Desert, uh, northeast of, of, of um, Beijing. And we've done some in this here. And he says, yeah. He said, he said I didn't know that. And I, and I said, well, you know, right. And he said, but I know much more about your brand and your business than any of your consumers do, because we spend time together. Oh. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, he said, so when a tree falls in a forest, OK, Mr. President, I get it, right? He said, you had a tree on the side of your boot. And, and, and the outdoors matters, right? Because if the outdoors didn't exist, no one's going to buy your boots. I said, yes, sir. He said, so why don't you tell folks, I care about the outdoors, comma, because my objective is to sell you another pair of boots. I said, well, that seems kind of you know, like low brow, sir. And he said, actually, what do you think they think of CEOs like you? I said. Yeah, they think we're kind of low prices, so hit them where they live. <laughs> and, I, and I said, go ahead. He said, instead of, 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 she doth protest her innocence, how about starting with, of course Timberland cares about the environment. Because if the environment didn't exist, we couldn't sell the boots. And if we couldn't sell the boots, I couldn't justify my salary. So please, buy a boot, we'll plant a tree, because it's all about me. And they believe that. They said, it's a martial art. He said, invite their strength, the consumers skepticism about the role of the CEO in social change, invite that skepticism to be powerful. Ah, oh, sold this guy. Good idea. Really good idea. So we quickly did a little research and asked consumers, look, we for 25 years partnered with City Year. City Year was an extraordinary program of, of transformation, inviting youth, idealists, to change their cities. We have stood with them from the beginning to the end. 
to the end is not in sight. We've, we've stood to them all along the way. Passionate investment. Consumers say back, that's nice. We believe in City Year, and we think it's nice that you support them. What does that have to do with selling boots? We said, but we're good guys. They say, great, we'll be a good guys. That doesn't help you make a sale to me. Interesting. Now, if you make your products sustainably, if you use material choices that are powerful, if you design the product to be disassembled and upcycled, if you, if you ask me when I buy a boot and you plant a tree in my name, do I feel good about that? Yes, I do. That's linking commerce and justice at a level of accessibility to the consumer that's powerful. We can't get Americans to vote, but we can get Americans to purchase. We actually don't have to work hard at it. Remember that? When the, when, when the going gets tough, people go to retail. Good, good. Please go to retail and please buy a Timberland boot because right, we have a view of the supply chain that says we can lower costs and environmental impact. And we have a view of the consumer proposition that says part of the value proposition will be values in action. That's the notion of moral capitalism that says we can connect together the front end and the back end. And I cited to all these powerful uh, people who are trying to do the same. Ready for the stirring conclusion? <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, imagine the possibilities if the CEO innovator within the framework of moral capitalism succeeds in integrating the two elements. On the one hand, innovating to lower costs and reduce environmental impact. And on the other hand, managing to engage consumers with a value proposition that includes the cost of a principled value chain. It's alchemy. It's lead to gold. And I say to you, don't tell me it can't be done. First of all, because I cite you concrete, practical examples of it happening. Right? You're all more sophisticated Kennedy School people, so you read The Prince, probably in the original Italian. Right? <laughs> but Machiavelli's really clear about this. The dare a nuovo ordine. Can you believe I'm trying to speak in Italian? I should definitely not do that. Oh. <laughs> I remember it in Italian, though. To dare a new order of things. Right? Has its, and it has opponents. It has opponents from people who are frightened by the notion of change and by people who are, who are who don't like the current circumstance uh, but are frightened by the notion of change and by people who are benefiting from the current circumstance and certainly oppose any change. And so what it, that boils down to nothing succeeds like success. Many people need to see empiricism to believe it can be done. What more empiricism do you need than Walmart, UPS, Federal Express, Marks and Spencers, IKEA? Want to keep going? We can. Right? Of people who are making concrete commitments at both ends of the process, on, on a consumer facing side and on a supply chain side. What more context do you need to believe that it isn't alchemy? I say, don't tell me it can't be done because it's, it, first of all, it is being done. And secondly, it ain't being done enough. Back to the point about we're not feeding our children, we're not clothing the naked, we're not doing our job. And so the question is, how do we make moral capitalism not the exception, but the rule? How do we insist upon it? So in the end, in the end, I'm going to tell you a city of your story. I'm going to tell you that it's all about the strength of our individual hands. And you know, I've been using mine to gesture because that's good speaker stuff, right? Use your hands. But I, I also was limbering up for the, for the stunning conclusion, which is now at hand, right? <laughs> city year is a city year's, part of city year's model is narrative as source of inspiration and engagement, right? You get to tell people stories so they can scale it to a personal level. They can hold on to it, literally hold on to it. So the story, one of the stories they tell goes like this: There was this old woman. And I would love to say she lived in a shoe, but, she, but <laughs> after all I invested, I think they couldn't change the story just a little bit. It would, it would make this such an easy kind of rap, but they won't do it. So there's this, this old woman, and she didn't live in my city. She lived in yours. And she lived in a garden apartment on the first floor. right? And by standards like that neighborhood that Babak was describing, right? you see that guy sitting there at the beginning with a cigarette in his hand? Who sold him the cigarette? I did. I'm a CEO. I know how to do that. I know how to get a cigarette in his hand. I do. And I can make a profit doing it. What do you mean we can't feed the hungry in that community? What do you mean we can't educate people in that community? I can put a cigarette in his hand. He doesn't want that cigarette. I can make him want it. That's the power of the private sector. You want to let that private sector continue to use that power to put a cigarette in his hand? Well, so be that. Be accountable for it. Because I don't want to. I want to, I want to harness the power of the private sector to take the cigarette out of his hand and to help create social change so that that neighborhood can have its, its, its human dignity. Nothing more, nothing less, right? And so this old woman lived in a neighborhood like that and she had human dignity. Not a lot, she didn't have a cell phone, she didn't have a fancy car, she didn't know what Facebook was, she hadn't seen the movie and she didn't care. 
because she thought she was living large. She was a woman of power and presence and purpose. It wasn't material goods that, that were her context. It was strength that she had to share. And the strength that she had to share in that neighborhood that we just drove by in the Delta, that neighborhood, she had a, a bird. She had a songbird. That's all she had. She put the songbird on the porch, not in the window. I'm modifying the story, right? And she left the songbird there every day so that when people walked by in that neighborhood, instead of the sign that says, I love that sign. That was brilliant marketing. Trespassers will be shot, and you'll be lying here dead when the police come to visit. That, to me, is effective marketing, right? That is, that's clearly, who are you seeking to serve? How do you seek to serve them? And be quick to the point. I, I get it, right? <laughs> So hers was a little bit more indirect, but she put the bird there and she said, I have strength to share. Do you? That was her question. Now, her view was that the, was the world of opportunity. The problem is there were young people in that neighborhood who moved the world through different eyes. The world of I don't have, a world of powerlessness, a world of I'm not the master of my fate, I am the victim of circumstance. In Boston, year to day, 53 murders. In this city, year to day, Boston, not Cambridge, Boston. Of the 53, 34 of them haven't seen their 30th birthday yet. Four out of 10 kids don't graduate from the Boston public school system. And that's a, a, a general view, not sliced by color. Because as you can appreciate, it gets worse for kids of color. Four out of 10, that's just the national average. And we drive on by. We drive on by. And of the 17 million hungry kids in America, 125,000 of those kids are within 15 miles of this hotel. 125,000. I, I didn't eat the lunch because I'm a kosher kid. But it was a beautiful lunch. And I don't want anybody to feel bad about the beautiful lunch, especially not this crowd. But I do want us to be conscious of the fact that this woman, she may have had children that didn't have access to that lunch. And that's just that, that, that's on our watch, right? It was these young people that didn't have access to the lunch, they decided to steal her bird because they were angry. Nothing is more powerful than powerlessness. Janis Joplin made it into a funny song. Freedom is just another word for nothing less to lose. That's a funny song, me and Bobby McGee. But in this day, in this age, with technology of interconnection and the power of powerlessness, it's a frightening notion. It's a frightening notion. And so the kids stole her bird. And they had it, by the way, you want to talk about entrepreneurs. I'm a successful entrepreneur. You're right that, right, that our, our market cap goes up and down. It's more in the ascending mode now than it was when I talked to you before. Uh, we lost a lot of money um, in terms of market cap because we didn't execute our plan. Uh, and we're executing it better, and we'll earn our way back. Uh, and I believe in that. But you want to talk about the best entrepreneurs in Boston. Uh, it, we, we wouldn't be able to visit with them just now, because it's still during the day. But if you want to go with me to Boston at night, which is a program run by the Boston Foundation, a friend of mine called uh, Robert Lewis Jr., if you want to go visit the best entrepreneurs in Boston, look, Timberland has the best sales outstanding in its industry. We get paid, our terms are 2% net 30. Please play us in 30 days. We get paid in 32 and a half days on average. Best in class in our industry. The entrepreneurs that I'm, that I'm not in a sense competing with, but for Man of the Year Award, the entrepreneur on Mission Hill is not getting paid in 2% net 30. Cash on the barrel head, right? He gets paid cash for his business. He has a better supply chain. I get four and a half times, five times inventory. He gets 52 times inventory or 62 times inventory, meaning uh, if you want to buy drugs from him, he will have what you need when you need it, he, he, as long as you have cash, right? A business system that works beautifully. Now, we call him a criminal, but there's an entrepreneur of power inside that criminal model. We don't invite that power. We, we shun that power. And that's not a good thing. And why do we shun that power? Look, you don't have to shun it. He doesn't need shunning. He knows that his chances of graduating from high school versus graduating to jail or graduating to early death, he knows how to rack and stack those choices. And that's why he stole the bird. And he stands in front of the old woman, and, he, and they have the bird in their hands. Right, because they got this thing thought too. It's not good enough to, to nail the bird. They, they, they got to really work her, right? This is after sales service, right? This is entrepreneurs who never run their business. They say, oh lady, is this bird alive or is it dead? And if she says it's dead, they're planning to open their hands and let the bird fly away. Like that, that it's like that horror movie, Urgh! just when you think it's safe to go back in the water, the shark shows up again, da, 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 right? And so the same thing, if they, she says the bird's alive, they're going to kill it. And they're going to say, ah, no, nope, you're wrong, the bird's dead. So they're going to have a, a, a second form of relationship with this one. They get the supply chain side right, they stole it from her. They have the value proposition right, they're standing in front of her and they say, oh, woman, is this bird alive or it's dead? Now, the question for us, right, is not is bird alive or dead. The question, I believe, is do we have the, the capacity of imagination and will to create scalable social change against the intractable issues that confront this generation? There is no excuse for the fact that they're hungry children in America. We have the money. We have the technology. We say we have the desire. I can tell you one thing for sure. We have the need. 
You can't say, I'm not going to debate science with you about global warming and not global warming, but I will make it clear that the destruction of the natural environment is real. Leave it just at that, because I'm not a scientist. Right? The question is, tisk tisk tisk, or let's do something about it. Right? Educational failures across the country, I know it's all their fault, the prior administration. But the prior administration, you're going to be a prior administration, and they're going to say the same thing about you. And we can have a really interesting debate, which is fine, except if you're one of the four in 10 that didn't graduate from high school. Because then, I don't care whose fault it was, I didn't graduate from high school. And I'll steal the bird, because I have nothing left to lose. I have nothing to live for. Is the bird alive or is it dead? Can we create a model of social change, neighborhood at a time? Can we scale it? Can we refine it? Can we execute it? Can we build it to last? Not without the private sector. It's not the private sector riding in on a white horse. I'm not making that point. I'm just saying that if we don't reinvent the model collaboratively, you can imagine the joke they're going to tell? The CEO, the government official, and the NGO person went into a bar. Right? That, that's going to be the joke. But the punchline is going to be they stayed sober, they stayed focused, and they came out with an agenda of shared strategic outcome that was mutually reinforcing in a governance methodology that held them accountable to each other through time. And all of a sudden, the things that couldn't happen, happened. We fed our children. We educated our children. And we saved this experiment called the human condition. Is the bird alive or is the bird dead? The old woman said, I don't know. I don't know if the bird alive or dead. But this much I do know to these young people. She said, the answer is in your hands, right? And so I've been gesticulating for a purpose because I wanted you to think for a second just now about your hands. This is not an average audience. And that's not a compliment. That's a challenge. It, it's so much easier to do the corporate speech in the morning, right? Because my voice is a crescendo by now. I'm, sweat is flying and the hair is going. <laughs> and I, and, and I, I am, in that sense, the world's greatest Diet Coke. I mean, I wind them up. And I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. I want them to see the possibility. But I'm deliberately speaking softer now because this is a different audience. You are cursed to be as blessed as you are. And, and those are strong words, but I just want to say it in, in context. When I say it's in your hands, it's not a rhetorical device. You can't watch that film and think it's somebody else's job. You can't see the empiricism. When I talk about Walmart, you, plenty of people say, I know, but I'm a, a relatively junior person in a big organization. How am I supposed to drive change? Nobody here can have that question. So when I say that, that it, the, the answer is in your hands, I am saying it not respectfully. I am saying it in a challenging way for two reasons. One, one is because um, as a citizen of the world, same as you are, I see the pain. I, 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 I've pledged in my own narrow mind way to do what I can to bring my strength to bear. I've told you my story. I'm 50 years old, and I'm on the back side of that conversation. You're on the front side of that conversation. And so as a citizen, I'm desperate for you to step up, in, over, connect. Bring the genius that can enact realities like that to scale. Force the CEO to the table. Make her pay attention. Make her part of the conversation. I, I say that as a citizen. I say that as a dad. I, told, I started out with, a, with a Noah's story. And Noah's finishing his high school year. He goes off into your world. He leaves my house and goes into your world. And so, so President Obama, in that narrow sense, very narrow sense, is right. CEO is a narrow, self-interested guy. This is all about Noah. This is all about Jeff as dad. This is all about, uh, when I say it's in your hands, I want to charge you with the responsibility to know it's in your hands. Because otherwise, otherwise, I don't know what kind of world we're going to end up living in. The power to change the social model is in your hands. It, in, I don't know if you could find a, a more powerful group of, of leaders than the fellows. Um, and so uh, no rousing conclusion. Just a, 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 a soft one tra trailing off into time. The old woman said, the answer's in your hands. The middle-aged boot salesman said, the answer's in your hands. It is an invitation and a challenge. Please, bear in mind the power that sits in your hands. Use it for high purpose. Build a model that's scalable, executable, and sustainable. Uh, the world that we live in is still redeemable. It's in your hands. Thank you.
have time for just a few questions. So if you can please state your name and your affiliation if you'd like and show us your hands. Casey and I are running around with the microphones. And please keep it short and sweet so a couple people have a chance to ask. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Trey Watson. Uh, I guess I, I don't remember when we graduated, 2008, one of the Zuckerman Fellows. Thanks so very much for, for joining us. Short and sweet question uh, is one that I'm trying to, to manage myself. I'm in education, working for Teach for America. Um, very likely to go work for Joel Klein uh, in a month or so. And when I heard you speak about this notion of moral capitalism, I couldn't help to equate that really to moral entrepreneurship, this notion of changing the model. One of the challenges that I'm trying to deal with is how do you, how do you reinvent, switch, change a model such that it's not the next model, but instead the next iteration? And I'm wondering, as it relates to your, your theory on moral capitalism, how you invest politicians to actually change culture that will allow us to effectively be entrepreneurs, i.e. celebrate, accept, build upon failure. Because I think that's where this comes in. You won't find, uh, I'm not sure that you'll find the profit that you're seeking, whether it be social or bottom line cash, without expecting some failure and looking for the opportunities. That's a really hard one. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for serving your skills up against the question of education uh, with Commissioner Klein. Uh, I know that when Jeff Canada went to see uh, Joel about uh, the education system in the Harlem Children's Zone, he went, uh, another one of my uh, real favorite poets, uh, he, he went in his guise as the emperor of ice cream. You know, Je Jeff went to, to call on uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Joel Klein in the, in the, in the mode of uh, a sales call as opposed to a supplicant's call. And it's not a small, it's not a, a small frame of reference uh, uh, shift. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful one. Um, so instead of, uh, uh, and I don't know if you know Jeff, but Jeff is an enormously humble man. He, he's not humble by style. He's humble of circumstance. He is, he is a genuine. He, he, his humility in a, in a, in a sacred sense, right? But his presentation is not humble. His presentation is, is um, powerful. And so he didn't say. I would like to negotiate with you around the notion of reforming education in the Harlem Children's Zone. He said to the, to the mayor of New York City, in my town, those will be my schools, right? And what he had in, 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 the, in the keel of that conversation is the Machiavelli point. There's nobody ever going to look across the table at Jeff Canada. At this point, 25 years later, an overnight success. 25 years later, an overnight success, and said to him, uh, you know, I, I doubt it, right? Because his track record is impeccable. But the problem is that it's like the same reason when somebody says to Timberland, uh, can I work in the marketing department? I say, no, we only hire people with experience. No, we only hire people with experience. But what happens when you run out of the world of people with experience? Somebody's got to be hired to get experience. How do you build a track record, right? When you're, I, I don't think the point of salesmanship is a small point, is what I'm saying to you, right? I think we, Social entrepreneurs that I encounter are, are often in the mode of, this is what I need from you. And I tell you, it's a, it's a pattern of conversation that's not exalted, right? Because as you can appreciate, there's a lot of, here's what I need from you, right? There's a, there's a broad sweep of that conversation. There's very little conversation that says, um, here's what I have for you, right? And w when Jeff went to see Chancellor Klein, it was very much, here's what I have for you. I have a track record. I have, uh, I lined up my sources of financing from the hedge fund guys, right, from uh, Stan Druckenmiller at Duquesne Capital. I'm prepared to execute. What I need from you is your commitment that you'll run interference with these three sectors of civil society, like the, the, the teachers unions. This is what I have to have conversation support from you about. The outcome that I'm signed up to is. Now, it's easier to do that if you're Jeff Canada than if you're Jeff Swartz. He has a track record there, and I don't. It, it, and you're somewhere in between me and Jeff. Uh, the, the two Jeffs on that one, right? So how do you frame that conversation? Look, I make sales calls all the time on people who don't want to say yes, right? I want to get them to do something they don't want to do. One of the hallmarks of a, of, a, of a good proposition is that I will have been so exhausted in my thinking. I will have had the conversation a hundred times. We knock each other down internally a hundred times before we see a customer. Because if a customer raises a question we haven't thought about, it, it could be they're on the wrong subject, or it could be, it, or we didn't do our job, right? And so when you talk about refining a model from within, you've got to use the strength of the system. No one is used to a social entrepreneur being professional. I mean that in the deepest respectful way. They expect the, the gleam in the eye that says, this is what I need from you. 
funding or job, support, love. Very rarely is the conversation focused that says, I have a proposition for consideration. Now, at City Year, we learned how to sell differently. For the first 10 years of City Year, we were looking around like, can we come to this city? How about this city, right? And then, I'm telling you the truth, Detroit, out of the blue, came to us. It wasn't on our list, and so Detroit came to us, and we didn't want to do Detroit. I'm not sure why. I, I think, you know, it was the Tigers or something. We didn't want to do Detroit. And so, we learned a language, a word in English language we'd never thought to use, a social entrepreneur before, which is no, right? And so we said to the Detroit guys, well, you know, strategic priorities, not Detroit, not sure. And they said, well, it was great, right? They said, well, under what circumstances would you come to Detroit? And there was this general click, clack, clack. That was Jaws hitting the table from the city of guys thinking, under what conditions would we come to Detroit? Meaning to say, you want us to come to you? You, you, instead of what we need from you, what you see as value from us, it blew them away. And so City Air is negotiating with Denver now. It's been a two-year process, but the conditions under, under what circumstances City Air will consider investing of its scarce genius in Denver, it's not arrogant. I'm not trying to make a, 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 a macho point. I'm saying, do you approach the model with this notion of exchange of value or the redistribution of value. That's my whole point. Social entrepreneurs typically approach the conversation as redistributive. You have something I need. And that's the whole conversation. As opposed to, we have an opportunity to create a value proposition, valuable to me and valuable to you. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I think. I think we can take one more question. Because <laughs> I make too long answers. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> No questions? <laughs> really? <laughs> I talk to the death. Excellent. Hi, uh, my name is Sushma Sheth. I am a joint degree student between the Harvard Kennedy School and Kellogg, where I'm getting an MBA. Wow. And um, I, I just wanted to say, I supremely enjoyed your remarks. Thanks. Um, and of all the P's that you mentioned, you really represented presence. Mm -hmm. um, striking given what you were doing over the last 24 hours. Um, but thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you make a very compelling argument for integrating um, corporate sense of efficiency and accountability into social change. And I, I will say or reveal that I am one of the many activists that have also been critical of corporate practices in the past. Um, but I'm now at business school because I believe I do have a lot to learn. Um, in terms of what it takes to see processes through, management, and a number of Beautiful. other things. Um, but you, you said accountability a few times, and I think there has been a question or a challenge of accountability within the private sector in the past two or three years. And so what new model or um, morale, you know, morals are you bringing to accountability that deflect against what we've seen in the last a Super years? question. In our industry for 10 years, activists fought a running battle I, I say this only because it's public. I wouldn't. I, I, I don't like these guys, but I do respect these guys. They were in a 10-year battle with Nike, and the objective of the battle was to get Nike to declare where their factories were located. It was a 10-year running battle. You will tell us where your factories are. Nike said, "That is the dumbest question anyone could ever ask." But thank goodness that's their question. So, so we'll say back, "No," and they said, "Oh no, you'll tell us." Nike said. They're still asking the question? No. As long as they keep asking the question where the factors are, they'll never get to interesting questions. Besides, if they were thinking about it for 30 seconds, you ever try to hide a shoe factory? <laughs> Just absolutely focused on the wrong question, right? Accountability, what's the question you're asking? My dad used to be like this. He's a second generation entrepreneur. He used to walk into the room and say, get me an orange. I said, okay. Get me a straw. Get him a straw. Get me a hammer. Get him a hammer, like, where are we going with this? And he'd sit down with the orange, try to stick the straw in and bang it with a hammer because what he was really saying is, I'm thirsty, right? It was all about the question. And I tell you, the majority of the activists that we, uh, we interact with on a over-the-counter conversation as opposed to a sit-down nose-to-nose, no fun conversation, but the over-the-counter ones, it's get me an orange, get me a straw, get me a hammer. And I tell you, the CEO view of that is, look, I got to be responsive because in the sense that I can't ignore it because maybe they'll wake up on the other side and ask the right question. If they did, then we'll actually have real issues we got to deal with. And so let's play with them. It, it, you know, let, let's keep it going. There's no value there. There couldn't, be any, couldn't possibly be value because if your question is, where's the factory? My answer is, I mean, honest to goodness, try and hide the factories in, in South China. 
right? So try and hide them. I could, we watched this and we couldn't understand. One airplane ride, this is before Google Map, right? So maybe now they wouldn't ask that question. But one airplane ride and you'd have everything you needed in one, in one conversation. And then you could get onto, now that you know the factors, what's your real question? If what you're really saying is, would you let me come into a shoe factory and see and understand what's this, the human rights circumstance, well, that's a different question. And potentially there's value in that. Potentially. I'm not speaking for Nike. I can tell you from Timberland's perspective, when people say, we put the name of the factory on the shoe box. Because we're in the view of, uh, if you've got something to say to teach us, we want to learn it. Right? And it's not hiding in plain sight. It's just, it's a different view. Right? And we learn from the Nike model. And they've got 10 years of grace on the conversation. Grace they shouldn't have been granted. They shouldn't have. Because the real question, what's it like to work in a shoe factory, is interesting. The answer, the answer, the answer is, it needs to be inspected. Right? And there's, for all the, the, the caterwauling about human rights, the, pro, the, the, the prospects you have in the developing economy to work in a, in a factory, a toy factory, the Apple factories in China, the Toyota factories in China, right? If you want to look across the brands that you in this room consume and, and ask yourself, what's it like to be inside that factory? Well, that's an environmental question. What's it like to be inside the mind and heart of the person working in that factory? That's a different question. If you want to have that conversation, I do too. If you're, but if you're going to attack me on, uh, if you don't give me the address, I'll fight you for it, I have to have the conversation because you chose the battle. I didn't. And if you expect me to say, I love you, but that's the wrong question. First of all, they won't respond to that. And the second thing is, I'm not going to do your job for you. Because I have, uh, I got a lot to do during the day. Right? So when you say, uh, what changed to the rules of accountability, um, it's not very different what I said to the gentleman about, um, please, let's focus our conversation around outcomes that are powerful. Right? So what do you want in terms of accountability from the CEO? What, what is this, what's the definition of transparency? Every 90 days, I have to re reveal our earnings to Wall Street. And I got Sarbanes and Oxley, the, the shortstop and the second baseman of, of legislative confusion, uh, who, who say, I got to sign a statement that says, I know how many pennies were in the till in Japan. I sign it. I have no idea. I couldn't possibly know. It's intellectually not knowable. I sign it because I, at Timberland, have a systematic understanding of the values of the enterprise. And so I believe that the person told me how many pennies there believes what they're saying. I don't say that they're right. I don't know that they know. But I do know that they are not willfully being wrong about it. Because our system won't tolerate it. It smells bad. People see that. It's not consistent with the values of the enterprise. And so people won't deliberately do that. Doesn't mean it can't happen. I'm just saying this, this standard of let's let the government tell us is just not helpful. It's just not helpful. It's well intended. It's the same reason they can't feed school lunches to kids in the summer. Because they forgot school's out. Now, they're not stupid. It's just that that's not their job either. The problem is they arrogate that to themselves. They say, it is our job. If they said, you and I have the job to feed school lunches to every kid in Colorado, I guarantee you we could do it. I guarantee you we could do it because we'd ask different questions. So what questions are you asking about transparency? And how are you asking the questions? Greenpeace sent me 65,000 emails a month ago that started, dear corporate scumball. You know, <laughs> and those are the nice ones, right? <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I didn't know I had that many friends. Like 65,000 emails uh, that, that clipped and pasted from their website that said, that said, you don't know where the hides that are being used by a Brazilian manufacturer of leather are coming from. And we're here to tell you they're coming from clear cutting in the Amazon. And you are despoiling the environment. And if you don't fix it, you die. Love Greenpeace, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and I said back to the Greenpeace people, it's not that I, it's not, I don't know. I didn't know. You're absolutely correct. I don't know about this. It, it, and we're going to engage because we are who we are. It would have been a very different process to get the same outcome, but you got to sell some membership, good for you. I'll take my bruise, we'll keep moving, because when the day is done, that question they ask is right. Do you know? No. And did I think we need to know? Yes. They enforced a transparency in our supply chain that nobody else did. And their tactics, which I didn't appreciate, were effective, are effective. Again, it's not the way I don't think to build sustainable relationships, but be that as it may. Be that as it may. I can tell you, we do know now. We do know now. They asked the right question. In terms of accountability, what question are you asking in terms of transparency? I release our social stats every 90 days, and I get a giant nothing. So I, 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 how do we find a way to have a conversation? But what's your expectation in terms of transparency? I think activists could help a lot in shaping that argument. And that's why I'm really glad you're at Kellogg School, because that blending 
of, that's exactly the point of moral capitalism. You're not going to turn out to be a corporate scumball. You couldn't. You're an activist in your heart. Your soul burns for an outcome of social justice that you aren't going to release. To the contrary, you're so passionate about the social outcome that you insist on that you think that adding private sector excellent skills will simply make you a more effective activist. That is the model of moral capitalism. And so when you decide how to hold me accountable on transparency, I ain't looking forward to the day. <laughs> because instead of saying, so where are your factories, big boy, you're more likely to say, I know where your factories are, and I don't think you thought through this issue of what it's like to live inside the mind, body, and soul of an 18-year-old woman who's working on the line making shoes for you in China. And here's three things that you better consider, you, you had better consider. And when you bring that conversation to us, you know what will happen? The world will get better. That's exactly my model. Force the CEO to the table. The most powerful way you can force the CEO to the table is the most powerful way you can force the CEO to the table. That's how we'll create sustainable social change. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today.